Welcome everyone. It's been a long time since I posted on this channel. Taken a break. I've uh, failed at some launches, if you will. Like, yeah, we're gonna relaunch this channel. And instead, I'm gonna take it back to just me kind of live streaming when it makes sense to talk about business and I feel like it. That happens to be this Sunday morning. Uh, I've been doing some private videos for select individuals and stuff kind of through email and uh, it takes the same amount of time for me to do a live stream as it does to make that private video and not everyone gets the knowledge. So I thought I would go ahead and kind of address this email I got in response to a video I had sent uh, and make it public. So the first question this person has is, uh, well, they're, I guess I got to give some background information. Uh, currently, the Aquarium Co-op, my business, all my business stuff that I do, None of it <clears throat> has active tracking. So what does that mean? That means we're not running Facebook pixels. We're not running uh, Google Analytics even, which seems crazy to most people, I would think. Um, but it's kind of a, a multi-pronged decision. So one, there is a lot of like uh, privacy issues and concerns in the media and just that kind of stuff right now. That's one thing. <clears throat> but the bigger thing that I've always kind of uh, realized or felt <clears throat> sorry, is that um, you can use it for good and evil. And so what I mean by that is if we have trackers on our websites, right? And so, and that includes, you know, we have other forums and, and it's more than just, you know, our own personal sales website. Um, when you track the data, right? So user A comes and they look at stuff on our website. It's going to show that, that user has intent to buy aquarium products, right? So then that data now lives inside of Facebook or um, inside of Google. Any of our competitors can then target us. So like in this email, they're saying, I had never really thought about that on how competitors could target keywords like Easy Green, Aquarium Co-op, Fish Co-op, and all of the users that came to our website would also be associated with uh, that, right? And so it allows our competitors to, to much easier target our business and capture our lead sources, right? So that's why, one of the reasons why I haven't done it. The other one is it slows down your website quite a bit and it's all proportional, right? If it only costs you a third of a second load time or something like that, that might not be a whole lot, but when your website loads in under a second, adding a third of a second is 30% slower, right? So that is, you know, with all those things, and I, I should elaborate, we don't do any paid advertising on Facebook and Google anymore. Not that we haven't in the past, and not that we wouldn't in the future, but right now, uh, I don't believe the return on investment is there for our business. And we've gone through multiple firms where, you know, we promise we can up your sales by X. And, you know, if we don't, it's money back and all of that. And we've never found a firm that can outperform what we're already doing on our social media channels. I think those work very well if you don't have a social media presence, right? You can kind of pay to play and that makes sense. But if you already have a social media presence, that is of sizable uh, size, I guess. Then you run into, you're paying to advertise to people that are already seeing your advertisements natively in your content. And that return on investment isn't nearly as good, right? So that's where we found that we can totally opt out of basically all of that and not have a problem. And we don't need to uh, retarget people and things like that that most people would do. We find that if you just accept the new norm and don't wait and live for, um, you know, the quarter instead, wait for the year, you'll find that people do come back and order from you anyway, if you're doing the right things. So that's why we've chosen not to, um, track people at this point. Now we have tons of analytics, you know, from everything everyone buys and we have, uh, emails we send out and, and all of that. But in terms of using third party trackers at this point, we're not using it. And his question, uh, that he asked me was, why don't you advertise that to the public? And we've thought about that, right? The problem is, let's say I build uh, our customer and fans trust on not using any trackers. If we were to have a problem with uh, social media or me, let's say I was super sick 
and I can no longer make videos and business revenue is declining, the minute we would turn trackers back on to maybe help us in some way, we would then lose all that base that we built on privacy and all that. We still have lots of privacy, but uh, we don't want to make that our pillar. Like I'd, I'd rather focus our marketing efforts. And that's something that I think everyone needs to do is you, let's say you get five minutes in front of a customer, right? And do you want to spend the whole time telling them about how you're not using Facebook pixels and Google analytics? Or do you want to tell them about how good your product is, right? I'm getting some, uh, some vitamins in. So yeah, and then they were just noticing that they've never seen our ads basically on on Facebook, on Instagram, on Google Shopping, and we just don't pay to do that. And instead, what we personally do is we go, and I, I do this kind of, I'd say every six months or so, and go, what would our projected budget look like for advertising right now if we were going through a traditional model? And that number gets pretty big normally. How could we reinvest that into our customers? So we give away free products with uh, shipments, and it's not spend X, get this for free. It's you placed an order, get this for free, right? Uh, things you would normally upcharge for, right? So if we were McDonald's, let's say, instead of saying, would you like to supersize that? That'll be 40 cents. Just supersize it for free, right? Instead of spending those marketing dollars to talk about how good the meal is, just make the meal better. That's kind of the philosophy we have. And so some of that comes into products like this where each one of these liners that we've designed for our business, we've made it so it's reusable. You could use it as a lunchbox. You could use it um, for taking frozen stuff home from the grocery store. These cost us money, right? They cost us money. We don't charge the customer. It costs more money to have them customized to make them better. This zip costs more money than just a normal like Ziploc top. All of that, you know, when we look at an average shipment, we might be putting in almost a couple of dollars worth of extra stuff. But if you look at a traditional marketing model, you might already be spending six, seven dollars to get a client anyway. And so this doesn't help us find new clients necessarily, but it helps us retain. We have a huge portion of customers that are retained uh, kind of year in, year out. So <clears throat> welcome everyone in the chat. I realize, uh, you know, quite a few people are there and talking and all of that. And I'll get to some questions as I see them if I happen to catch them out of the corner of my eye. <clears throat> so the next thing uh, this gentleman was talking about is you've created what some may call a cult following, which is amazing from a marketing perspective. And he's done a little bit of research through Alexa and Google trends. And it seems that interests in aquariums uh, are dying off, right? Now, that is one way to look at it. And... I am always hesitant to try and predict, is something growing? Is it dying back? You know, a lot of it is. So if you're looking through Alexa uh, and Google keyword searches and stuff like that, has it just changed? Are people looking for different things, right? And there's lots of ebbs and flows. Maybe last year you would say camping is dying. And then COVID happens, and now it's seen like a 10,000% increase, right? Getting outdoors and camping and do of all, doing all of that. And kind of the same thing is I don't think when you look at the whole pie, right, and you're trying to judge how big of a pie is this, whether that pie is 10,000 people or it's 10 billion people, it doesn't really change that much, right? So take a business that's only 10,000. There's only 10,000 customers. But if you get all 10,000 customers and it's a local retail store, you're doing really well, right? Now, if it's 10,000 customers worldwide, oh, hello, thank you. If it's 10,000 customers worldwide, then uh, that's a different, you know, maybe business model. But even if you capture all 10,000, logistics are different, but it's mostly a proportion of customers. And so, like when we had our, well, we still have our retail store. When we were looking at that, if a local area could support before we entered the market, let's say five or six stores. It was always kind of teetering. You'd see kind of one drop off, one pop up, one drop off. We know we just have to not be in the last two stores to stay around. And so obviously you try to be the number one store, but as long as you're not in the bottom half, it's unlikely even with a squeeze, right? 
So even right now, if you were in uh, the travel sector, right? A lot of of traveling going on, all of that. If you were that influencer or whatever, people are still, there's still diehards that are going, I can't wait to travel. I'm still consuming information. I'm still looking at travel credit cards and all of that. So if you're still in the top little pile, right? You're still going to be afloat as a business. It's the people that are the lowest. So um, while, yes, you could be in a decline or in a surge. In a surge, more people, right? So if, if, if our local area could support five stores, right, in a surge, maybe it supports eight. Well, if you're always in the top four, whether it's surging or not, you don't worry about it anymore, right? And so that's kind of our ethos is continually just get better. So even if we're number one, try to stay number one. If you're number two, be working towards getting to number one. And and number one is relative, right? You can never know where you are in the market. You can measure on a bunch of different things. You know, is it customer service? Is it pricing? Is it overall sales? Is it growth this year? Was it, you know, you can basically pat yourself on the back any way you want. You could tweak it like, we did this the most out of anyone. We're number one, but we didn't do that, right? So there's always a different sector to improve upon, I believe. Been doing a lot of talking, been filming a lot lately. And I actually learned through a fan that salt actually helps the vocal cords and everything, so that's why I'm drinking some broth. All right, next up. Um, well, maybe I'll, I'll chime in here. All these bonus things, bags, heat packs, and whatnot, you think people in general would object to those few extra dollars for those? I mean, you run a business that's always could be better uh, mark better margins. I, I do believe they would. Like, so a heat pack, if you're watching this, you're not familiar with my business, would be to keep plants warm during shipping. Most competitors charge anywhere from 2 to $4 per heat pack. Now, some would say, aren't people willing to pay that? On average, yes, they are. But there is probably 25% of all clientele that will try and do things cheaply. I don't think it's going to snow. I don't think it'll be that cold. I think it'll be all right. So inherently, 25% of people aren't going to purchase the heat pack, right? Therefore, you're going to send out your packages, and 25% of customers are not going to be happy when they arrive dead. So 25% is a huge number. A lot of people, and and that 25% includes willingly, they don't want to pay for it, includes the, I forgot to add it, includes the, I don't think I need it, right? All of those categories are together. So all of those things. And so we try to eliminate how do we make sure that they don't mess this up, right? And that we want them to have a good experience every time, not only when they paid the extra. Same thing if you go to a hotel, just because you're buying the standard room rate, you expect it to be just as good as any other time. Not, well, you didn't buy the presidential suite, so therefore it's going to be a bad experience for you. You have to get at least a minimum threshold. And I believe our freebies and things do that. The other problem you have is when things do go wrong, right? So you have to reship and all of that. And when you look at the analytics, typically that's going to cost you 20 times as much as just putting the original one in. Um, So we find that streamlining employees and all of that will actually save more money or or get close to breaking even compared to going, well, the customer has to pay for everything now, right? And there is a clientele I I typically am one of those clientele. I just want to pay the price. Like you charge me what it costs to do it right. That's why I'm not a big fan of tipping and things like that because now you're in this weird spot of, well, how much do I pay to get this done correctly? I don't know this industry, so therefore I don't know how much to pay anymore. And uh, I think just just, uh, covering it all evenly is the best thing you can do. I'm going to pop out my chat here real quick because I feel like... I may be missing some key key comments. So there's no doubt, you know, our costs are higher than our competitors. Our customer service is higher than our competitors. Our quality is higher than our competitors. And you know, if we're if we're going back to judging as the hobby uh, growing or decreasing, not only in a hobby like that, uh, you're going to have levels, right? So the person that wants the absolute best and spends $10,000 a year on 
aquariums and fish supplies and subscriptions and magazines and all of that, it is unlikely they will leave the hobby. Someone who's newer to the hobby, they have a much higher chance of getting out. So by targeting the higher end clientele, we see a lot less kind of expansion and contraction of our potential clientele. Now, we kind of have this clientele, and then there's a clientele below it that we're constantly trying to help upgrade to. You know, if you, if you see here, if you pay this extra money, you're going to get this great experience, right? And so we're trying to kind of pull them up to the next level. And that helps us streamline things and, you know, not have to answer questions like, well, how do I, how do I keep a plant that's half dead alive? Instead, we focus customer service on let's just help them grow plants because when we ship them, they will live. Someone said, I thought honey helps the throat. It does. I have, uh, I have these too. So these are little like, uh, not cough drops, but they just have a lot of vitamin C and they've got honey and stuff in them. Uh, because I just spend all day long talking, whether it's, you know, podcast material, being on other people's stuff, filming our own stuff in meetings, uh, my voice really takes a beating. And, uh, you know, you wouldn't think it until you actually start looking at it. And I've had weekends where come Monday morning, I can't talk. Like I've talked so much in an event or something like that, I actually lose my voice. So, all right. Uh, do you view exclusivity as a key to success? Like, would it be a problem if the co-op co competitors began carrying extreme resists? We have tons of competitors that carry our products. Yeah. Uh, that's all the more reason to double down and do a better job. Like, there's Burger King, there's McDonald's, there's Sonic's. There's all these places that sell burgers. You choose based on who you think has the best taste, who's fast and efficient, all of that. There's always going to be competition. And even if they didn't carry the same fish food, they're going to carry another fish food in which they'll claim is as good or better. There's always competition. All right. I'm going to continue on to this email so we can keep progressing through. Um, let's see here. So I, I've stated that our mindset is more like an Apple mindset. Um, as in the company like iPhones and that kind of thing. And, and what I meant by that was we want to focus on a very narrow part. So I or Apple, they basically do computers and then they, so that, okay, let me, let me build out my full thought here. They start out with like a desktop computer, right? Then they got into laptops. Then they got into phones, which people might think that's different, but the phone is just a smaller computer that now is in our pocket. So it's a smaller laptop, right? So they've kept the same trajectory, right? Now they have the watch. It's just a smaller version of the phone. So they keep doing the same thing. And there's a few other things. There's AirPods, a few accessories, if you will. But you don't really see them doing a whole lot of other stuff. And when they do, it's more marketing. And I also, you know, you see Tesla do this a lot. Yeah, they do cars, they do batteries. They do a little bit of solar, you know, that's coming up and they, you know, have a different company that's doing rockets, but things like the tequila, the boxer shorts, the, uh, the, not the flamethrower, all of those are just larger dollar marketing campaigns, right? It's no different than us, uh, giving away candy or something, you know, like aquarium co-op Reese's peanut butter cups. We spend $20,000 and people will be like, you're selling them. It's mostly for the marketing. It's we it's not a good business model of like selling candy to make a profit. It's the the marketing of it. Just like their flamethrowers and all that. Maybe they made a dollar, you know, a couple of dollars, but proportionally to the rest of their business, it was a waste of time outside of very clever marketing. That was so cool. I now know what Tesla is. I'm going to buy a Tesla in 10 years. So our Apple mentality is Well, here's one right here. Like Clean, simple packaging. This is the watch I'm wearing for, you know, doing workouts and stuff. But clean, simple packaging, high-end feel, uh, just works simple, make it very easy, user-friendly. All of those things translate to what we do. And the other thing I was talking about in a previous video with this gentleman was you don't really see Apple advertising. And what I mean by that is, like, yeah, they'll do some stuff, but... I don't get retargeted on Facebook and Instagram about the latest iPhone or AirPods or anything like that. And typically, 
once you're in the iPhone or the Apple ecosystem, right, you know where to get it. You're going to get it at either a big box store, you're going to get it at your cell phone carrier, or you're going to buy it from Apple directly. It's unlikely that you are an Android user or a Windows user right now, and the next Facebook ad you see, you're going to be like, you know what, I am going to completely change my life and switch over. It's usually a much more calculated thing. If you might be watching YouTubers, you might be finding a feature you can't live without. And so therefore, that kind of marketing, you know, their acquisition cost might be $700 to switch someone over. It's something like Coca-Cola and Pepsi do the same thing where it's like a few hundred dollars to get someone to convert from Coke to Pepsi or vice versa, right? And you know how much Coke and Pepsi they have to buy over how many years to equal that much profit? And so you get to a point where, like with Coca-Cola and stuff, it was actually cheaper for them to gain market share doing Sprite than it is to get someone from Pepsi to Coke. It's easier to get them from Pepsi to Sprite than it is Pepsi to Coke. Cost less. So um, for us, it's not necessarily you know, about that money mindset. It's that we want to focus, and I want to focus on you know, releasing iPhone number 13 next year and making it the best iPhone. Is iPhone 12 good? Yes, I love it, right? But next year, I'm likely to buy another one if it gets even better. And couldn't they just go, well, okay, today, we're, you know, we're going to make headphones, which they do make headphones, but they can keep expanding into other stuff. Like, oh, well, now we're making USB power banks. Now we're making all of these things that make sense but aren't specialized and they won't necessarily be the best, right? So we kind of have the same mentality of stick in our lane. You know, we don't venture out into saltwater aquariums and cichlid tanks too often, even though we're knowledgeable about it. We're not known for it. It takes entirely new marketing strategies and campaigns. Um, and we find that to be a distraction. You know, in the previous email, um, they were asking, why don't we sell dogs, cats, all the other pet line stuff? And... It's because I've seen lots of people do that and they stop staying on top of things. So imagine we now sell dog and cat food, just two more, two more sectors. Every time there's a recall, right? Every time there's a recall on dog food, we have to track down the customers that bought it. We have to get it back. We have to refund their money. And no matter what, the customer will lose faith in us. Even though it's the manufacturer's fault, they will go, oh, well, you're carrying these weak brands and that kind of stuff. It always affects the bottom line. And so meanwhile, while we're doing that, we're not spending time making sure that we're making the next best iPhone. We're, we're continually updating this product, making sure what else can we give for free? We're spending this money on marketing to people going, hey, we sell dog and cat food now, right? Shouldn't we have just taken that money and made our own products better, give more in the package, improve customer service, all of those things to make sure we don't go from, and I, I don't know that we're number one, but let's say we're number one. Now we're bringing dog and cats and we're number 72. We're trying to bring that up. So it's coming up. Okay. We're now 23rd in dogs and cats, but we're also third in aquatics, right? 23rd in dogs and cats is nothing. Third in aquatics. Now we've lost two ranks and you might go, okay, now we settled out, right? And we're 12th in everything. That's a way worse position to be than some really high on something and just not even in the other sector. All right. How important do you, th do you view marketing to business success? Like for instance, Tesla had no marketing budget at all. Do you think that the, that model is unrealistic for most companies and word of mouth is strong? Uh, I think there's different ethos. Um, you know, you can't know how everyone is in front of a camera and, and that kind of stuff. I, I don't think one size is going to fit all. But in general, I think right now people are leveraging way too hard on you have to be you have to spend money to be seen. And we spend tons of money. Don't get me wrong. We spend lots of money on advertising. But it's for this camera you're watching me on right now. It's for people to help edit videos and write blog articles and and newsletters and customer service and free products and all of that. All that's being spent. It's just not being spent in the same rat race that everyone else is spending where it's like, okay, there's, there might be 
there's probably 50 aquatic companies spending money in Instagram ads, Facebook ads, Google shopping ads, and we could throw our money in there. And what happens with that, if you don't know, is it's a bidding system. So company one goes, I'll pay one penny to show my ad. Company two goes, well, I'll pay a penny and a half. Company three says, I'll pay three pennies, right? And now you've got 50 companies and it might be up to 26 cents to show your ad. Meanwhile, it stopped being profitable at five cents and you could have went to a different platform. You could have bought your own camera, could have hired talent, could have done all of these things because you do it at scale, right? And so 26 cents doesn't seem like a lot until you had to have 22 ads shown to the same person to get them to your website, right? So now you're at four or $5. They still haven't even purchased yet. Now they're just getting emails from you and you're still trying to onboard them. And so that is one thing, but if, if, what am I trying to say here? If everyone's doing the same thing, it doesn't work. If everyone's advertising on Facebook, your ad becomes inefficient. Similarly, if everyone's doing Facebook ads and you make uh, a flamethrower, you stick out. If everyone's going, okay, let's all launch crazy stuff. It no longer has that same impact anymore. And you were better off doing Facebook ads and traditional marketing. And so really it's, what's the right mix of traditional marketing and like paving the way in a different, uh, you know, paying a different or paving a different path to marketing. And in two years, in a year, in six months, it always changes, right? What's, what's the next new path? We don't know, right? We don't know that. All right. I'm glad the co-op hasn't embraced the Apple mentality of squeezing every dollar possible out of a customer. I'm boycotting them just because I think they're overpriced. See, I think that's a user opinion. In my opinion, Apple products are underpriced, right? If you were to take this device and the fact that I can run my entire company from it, the fact that I can shoot videos that rival this camera in the right light and all of that, this allows me to do everything. I actually, I actually think this device could be $5,000, right? We might not buy a new one every year, but I don't think this device is actually overpriced for what it accomplished. So think about a car. We might spend somewhere between 20 and $50,000 on a brand new car and they last us for, let's say 10 years on average, the average consumer, right? And we use that every day. We use this far many more hours every day than we do a car and this is an absolute fraction of the price. Now you could say, but there's cheaper cars. You can buy used cars. You can buy older cars. You can buy cheaper phones too, right? But when it comes down to quality, and this is from someone that I've bought every single Samsung phone and every iPhone and tested them side by side, over and over again, iPhone is a better polished product that has fewer errors, fewer uh, app problems and integrations with other things, right? And the ecosystem is just better for being productive. Now, could it be priced out of some people's reach? Certainly, there's cameras that are $100,000 that I don't own, it's out of my reach. But do I think it's overpriced? I don't necessarily think it's overpriced because at a certain point, you need that. If I needed to buy a crane, let's say I need a crane, right? For my business, I need a crane. And you're going, a crane is $2 million? Is it that a crane is overpriced? Or is it that a crane costs a ton of money to build, right? And so for sure, there is gonna be, okay, but you could build an iPhone for half as much money. And it's like, sure, you can build it with physical parts, but who does the R&D development and all of that? That's the thing, it was like, and we run into that all the time. People can, the next person to reinvent one of the products that we make better, they're gonna go, when they do it, it will be cheaper because they didn't have to spend a year trying to build it, they just copy a model of it. Right? So I personally, in marketing, if you're a marketer, right? If you're marketing a business, the cheapest place you can spend your money is a brand new phone every year. That's the best advertising dollars you can spend. 
upgrade the camera, make sure it's working, give yourself more options, all of that every year. Because in this day and age, you know, you're making stories, you're making shorts, you're making Instagram pictures, you're making Instagram stories, you're making Facebook posts, you're making Facebook stories, you're shooting videos, you're taking, you know, proofs of a product going, boom, let me email that and make this change. This thing accomplishes all of that, right? And you'll, you'll see people buy a camera, you'll see them buy this, you'll see them buy that laptop. All of those things do less than your phone will do. That is, that's why I don't think phones are overpriced. I actually think they, they can go up more. In fact, we're considering uh, buying the new $2,500 phone that allows us to live stream on the go using four 5G connections and, be able, and this camera could then now go on the road, right? A lot of people are saying it's way too expensive. The technology hasn't existed before. And so will it come down in the future? Yeah, probably like everything else, right? But at the time right now, is it too expensive? I don't think it is. It's, it's a first to market type of product. So the value of something, an iPhone, for example, is relative to the user. If you use your phone for business, it's far more valuable than the average person that uses it uh, to search Tinder, for sure. I mean, that's the thing. It's like no one makes us buy a phone. You could use one from 20 years ago and it will still work, right? So we're all buying luxury purchases and it's all under the, um, you know, under the guise of we need more and can you even utilize more? There are people that will never utilize more. They get the newest iPhone and they never take a picture. They never do anything that's, you know, labor intensive on there, but they just wanted it. And then there's people that are going to push it to the max, right? Right. So when I'm pushing it to the max, I'm in a greenhouse and I'm filming and the phone's trying to overheat. So I need it to run cooler. I'm in the, I'm in the Amazon. This water's going, or this phone's going underwater. And so why, why would Corey use iPhones? Well, one, I can airdrop to the other phone easily. So I took multiple iPhones. One goes underwater. One stays above water. One stays back on the boat. When you get back to the boat, you offload all the footage. All of it can charge by USB and solar that we're using. And all of that worked much better than this camera right now. That's a $3,000 camera filming on right now. It's not waterproof. It wouldn't do that. SD cards can get corrupted. So can my iPhones, but I have backups between them, right? I can also upload when it, whenever we get back to a port or a hotel, I could start uploading. So there's a lot of things and we don't always need the, the stuff, but it's very easy to have a perspective of that's too expensive. I wouldn't do that. Just like I might not rent a billboard for $10,000 a month, but maybe the law office down the road does and it makes them tons of money because their product they sell is way more than mine. You think the newest iPhone is more than worth the Google Pixel? Yes. We literally test every single phone and yes, it's uh, so here's the thing. Every year there's two phones that are really good. There's the iPhone and there's an other phone. It's been that way for the last 10 plus years. iPhone is always the first or second best always, right? And you can argue which is actually the best, but the two spot, that changes. That's been Samsung, that's been Google Pixel, that's been the VR30, that's been uh, uh, some foreign phones, some Sony phones, all of that. But the iPhone's always a contender. And so, you know, you could spend time every year researching that, or you can work on your business and just have the best phone. And that's the iPhone. And don't get me wrong, I was an anti iPhone guy. I was that how would you ever spend that much money 10 plus years ago? I always had Android devices until I got into the ecosystem. I was like, wow, this actually does make sense. It actually is better. It actually does work better more often, more of the time. Right. And all the devices, they all hold value. I give them to uh, family members. We raffle them off to employees, things like that. They're always still useful after I'm using them and I have to keep multiple around for what I do. All right. Is there a change in your business? Wait, is there a change in your business the pandemic has caused that you think will continue after the pandemic? Uh, I think one of the things we're really finding out is our retail store is much more profitable when there is less people in the store. So right now you have kind of have to wait in line to get in the store. 
We have a restaurant beeper style system. You know, if you ever had to wait to get in on a Friday night, they give you that thing and then you get your table, right? Well, we're using that system <coughs> in our retail store because we have to limit the capacity. Um, we now limit the parties inside the store to as many sales associates as we have. So we have currently right now at the store, I think three or four, like as, as we're taping this or filming this, there'll be three or four parties in the store and each one is limited to about 20 minutes. Now, people generally come in now with, these are what I need, here's what I'm looking for, and here's the questions I have. Let's get all that wrapped up, and they're out in about 20-ish minutes. Before the pandemic, you'd have people that would stop by every day on their lunch break. I'm just looking, I just wanna sit and chat, Tie and they, they tie up customer service reps, right, or, or sales associates, and that, well then, if they're caught in a conversation, now they can't help this person over here that's kind of waiting. You know, they're doing that polite, like, okay, well, when they're done talking, I'll, I'll get what I need. And so overall, though, it leads to less sales throughout the day. And so we're actually serving people less, um, less efficiently. Now, we're definitely trading that for we're building less of a community there. It's not just like, oh, yeah, I come out every lunch and I talk with Robert, the store manager, every day. And the, the business pays for that. So... That is something that we're looking at going, well, how, when the pandemic goes away, how do we maintain this level of efficiency and make things better, right? Because Saturdays and Sundays are a madhouse in the store, regardless of when it is. And so, you know, one of the things we're doing, we're hiring more people. So one of the good things is, if we limit how many people can come into the store, we now have more room for more employees to check people out. So it used to be we could only ever run like three people in the store because there'd be so many people in the store they couldn't move around, right? Well, now if we go to four all the time, there could be four employees and four people kind of getting helped efficiently at one time because there's not as many other people. Because you get real boom and bust where it'd be like 30 people in the store, two people in the store, 15 people, 30 people, six, and now it's much more four. There's always four associates and four groups of up to two people at all times. And so it's it's much more, instead of having that lunch rush and the dinner rush, it's constant. And that allows us to, I think, actually help people in a better way. And we, we become more profitable. So we're looking at it and it's going, well, how do we sustain that? Um, and it's a it's a happy finding. We, we had flirted with that idea in the past of a, a numbering ticketing system, like at the DMV, where you kind of show up, grab your ticket, we call the next person. Um, but I think the restaurant style is a better is a better uh, a system that we've got going. All right, let me chime back in on this. So this person is saying, um, you know, he's saying you probably know you know, you probably know this, but or don't know this, which I knew a lot of this. But this person is doing he's got online like classes. He's published some eBooks sell stuff on eBay and Amazon stores. He's got his own website, affiliate review websites, and his YouTube channels, right? So he's got all these varied sources of income. Uh, and he says, I like knowing that if one fails, I still have the others, but I feel like they're mediocre levels, right? It's somewhat difficult for him to focus since he loves them all. This is, uh, you know, oh, well, and he says, do you have any advice on making decisions to focus on the things you love? Yeah, so I'll answer that and then I'm gonna go into the next part. But right now, the advice is diversify and do all the things and make 400 little passive stream of income, right? And just like marketing, if everyone is doing that, it's a saturated thing. So, you know, if I sit out tomorrow and I'm like, I'm gonna to learn to play tennis like a professional, I'm gonna ride dirt bikes professionally, I'm going to open up a maid cleaning service and I am going to become an Olympic swimmer. And each week I spend four different days, like today is tennis day, today is Olympic swimmer day, today is maid company day, and today is whatever the other thing I said was, right? All of those are gonna progress very slowly through the years because I'm only devoting one fourth of my time to each one, right? Now, if I devote all of my time towards one, okay, I'm gonna start a maid business, right? A cleaning business. You, you, you probably will find after a few weeks, few months, 
you can't actually fill all of your time with it, right? But you might be able to fill 70% of your time, leaving 30% on the table. You're wasting 30% of your time. You're still growing that business at 70% versus your competitor growing at 25%. So you're still leaps and bounds. After a year, right, it's going to take them three years to do what you've done in a year. And that's the, what we do. If we, I mean, I literally spend every waking day without taking vacations and things like that working on my business. And so every day I'm getting 16 hours of work done, seven days a week, not five days a week, right? And so if the average business owner, which I believe this to be true when I study them, they're spending somewhere between eight and 10 hours, five days a week on average, right? So let's cap them at 50 hours. Let's cap me Let's, let's, let's back it off a little bit and say two of the 16 I'm not efficient at. And this is assuming they're efficient at all 10 of theirs, right? So I've got 14 hours a day uh, and I do it seven days a week. They've got 10 hours a day doing it five days a week. So 50 and I've got, what is it? Uh, 98. I've got 98. So in a year, I basically will have accomplished twice as much as they have now, a lot of things that people don't factor in is that there are going to be things that take up time every day that won't be pushing your business forward. For instance, accounting. Let's say I have to go, okay, let's take a look at the numbers. I've got to pay bills. I've got to do all that. Whether I spend 100 hours a week or I spend 10 hours a week, I might have to spend an hour doing accounting. So therefore, you know, if I only spend 10 hours, that's 10% of my time doing accounting work. But if it's 100 hours, right, that's 1% of my time. And so that's going to leave proportionally more time to do things outside of the business and grow it forward. So when I was in the retail store, eight hours a day you're in the store, you're working, you're interacting with customers, you're making your money, and that's an eight-hour fixed set. Average competitor has an hour before and after to do some accounting and just some wrap-up and all of that. So they've got two hours each day, right? But I would work until basically midnight. So if we closed up at eight, that's another four hours on top. And we started two hours before, I'd get six more hours. And so I would on average get four hours further. I'd have, I'd have six hours to handle tasks. They would have two. So I was doing three times as much work every day to make my business grow compared to they were, even though they were working 10 hours and I was working 14, right? So that's where you can get into uh, the problem of doing all the things. You do all the things. They're all going to grow kind of slowly. And it's really easy for someone to come up from behind you and pass you. If, if all of a sudden I was like, I'm publishing ebooks and I put all my attention to that, we might put out an ebook every two days or something, you know, and you're going, oh my gosh, I'm being swamped. Whereas if you were only doing ebooks, or let's use our YouTube channel, for example. Like right now, we're putting out a lot of YouTube videos. Uh, it's hard to pass us because we've got such a content schedule coming out. If we were only putting out a video once a month, it's easy for someone else to take our spot, right? And yes, you have to do good videos. You'd have to write good eBooks. You can't just put sheer volumes out. That's not how it works. But uh, there's a lot of things that go into it. So uh, I, I do think, you know, what to focus on, that's hard. You know, I think... You know, you can focus on things you love, but those don't always make you money, right? Like I actually really, really love business and I like aquatics as a hobby. Now, because I loved business so much, and the reason I know I love business is because I was doing this back in high school and I didn't start keeping any fish until after college, right? So I'm lucky in that I took my business knowledge and made aquatics profitable, right? So that I do love business and I still do that all the time. I like aquatics a lot and I get to do that all the time. So that worked out for me, but I wouldn't enjoy writing eBooks, you know, and, and I would ask you if you're looking at this from critical eye, do you love writing eBooks or do you love the money that comes out, the passive sales, the passive streams of income, right? Usually that's what people love because if you really love doing eBooks, you'd write way more of them. And it's rare to find someone that genuinely loves doing 10 different things equally. A lot of times you'll find out, oh, you just love the money. And that, don't get me wrong, money's great. So don't not like money. But, um, you know, focus on do I like the result 
or do I like the process of doing something? Like I really enjoy uh, improving products, making them better and that type of stuff. That's really fun for me. The actual selling of it, it's not as fun because it's like, okay, we did it. Yeah, it's working. You know, after you get the feedback loop of like people love it, it's working, all of that. That's not as fun as like the leading up to it. Like, ooh, are people going to be super excited or is this going to be a bust? I don't know. I worked really hard on this. You know, it's kind of like you're turning in your work for a grading. All right. So the next one was when you first started and you didn't have as big of a support team as I do now, which I do have a big support team. I'm sure you had to decide between your physical store, YouTube, new products, online store, and more. Did you have difficulty in choosing what to go after? Not at all. Uh, I don't think it should be difficult. It should be very rational decisions, right? So the physical store was a thing. The physical store then got to a point where it had stagnated. Two years in a row, it had made the same amount of money. It had hit a plateau, right? I then thought, okay, I'm barely making ends meet here. Like this is not, I cannot live off this long term. I have to get more money coming in. So my thought was, uh, do YouTube and Facebook specifically, both those. If I could get some traction there, it would bring more people to my local store and that would work. So I did that and I kept doing it knowing that, um, you know, at the time, okay, I'm working at the store eight hours every day, right? That still was that got to do that time, right? And then for you, it might be you're going to your eight hour a day job, right? But then you've got that six other hours every day, right? And YouTube, maybe that's an hour every day, an hour every day spent doing YouTube and an hour every day doing Facebook, right? And eventually after some time that catches on. Most people will give up like, okay, I did that for like two months, didn't do anything, I gave up. Instead, I kept doing it. And eventually, once it takes off, then that one hour is now really worth it. But I go into it knowing, just like opening a store, I'm gonna do all this work, invest all this money to make $2 an hour? That's what my profit is after all of this? Knowing that someday down the road, it might be better. And that's the same thing with YouTube or anything, right? You got to invest all of this time because if it was just put a little bit of time in, make tons of money, everyone would be doing it and then you wouldn't be able to do it anymore. That's kind of how it goes. If it is that easy, it won't work. So I like it when I know I'm getting something that's going to be really hard to pull off. I know if I can pull it off, it's really hard for someone else to come in and pull it off too and therefore become competition. So for me, physical store already had it. Using the extra time I had, and before that, it might have been uh, we were doing things like mailers. We were doing uh, newsletters. We were trying other things to get people in the door, you know, putting flyers out, had sign waivers, all that kind of stuff. That wasn't giving results. But all of that took time and money and energy to facilitate and plan. Then we go to Facebook and YouTube. And after some while, it does start producing results. So that that's good, right? And eventually, we grow online in that people are wanting us to send the products. And so we didn't do it for many months going, no, we don't sell, we don't ship, we don't sell outside of Washington State. And then eventually the demand was there where it was like, okay, let's start trying it. And we, tr we literally just started listing one product a week. And I remember the first product we put on there was Prime. It was just a you know, very basic product, put it on there. And when it sold, we'd buy more. And it was, we only had three bottles. Three bottles of Prime is what we had because that's what we had on the shelf. And so we had to buy more when um, you know, we run out. And a couple of times we did run out and the in-store customers were angry, so we'd buy more. We'd keep reinvesting, right? And then eventually the online store is going okay-ish. We then hire a video editor, right? And then eventually YouTube's making enough and then we hire a blog writer. And then eventually online sales are going well enough, we hire customer service. Then eventually it's going well enough that we have to open up a warehouse because up to this point, you know, we were running it all out of a thousand square feet. Um, we had the store, the next door was the warehouse, you know, warehouse, it was a stock room basically. And we were just continually making one step after another. And that's the thing is you don't need to sprint just every day. Just, you know, imagine you've got, you're carrying something really, really heavy, right? Just crazy heavy. You can barely pick it up. And all you got to do is, take that one step forward and you're shaking and you're holding it together, right? You're putting everything you got into it. 
and then eventually one more step, right? Or you could take a tiny little one and run and drop it off and run back and pick up another one and drop it off, right? But that typically uh, burns people out. You get tired, you expend all your energy and if you can kind of rest a little bit, you know, and eventually you take a step forward, you take a step forward, you can set it down, just rest, you know? And then you're gonna pick it back up and you're gonna walk, you know, and then eventually it's just a never ending walk. Like you're just carrying it all forward and you're not worried about where is, you know, the ending point, just knowing I gotta keep going, just gotta keep going. And yeah, so, you know, now we have online, we have all of this and like, what's the next thing, right? And it's like, well, I'm not really worried about it. We'll know when we get there. And that kind of, you know, we've wanted to develop very expensive products, things like LED lights and that kind of stuff. And it's crazy expensive. We're talking quarter of a million dollars or more to get into that market. Couldn't do that last year. Couldn't do it the year before. Might not be able to do it this year or next year, right? But at a certain point, we'll be forward enough that we have that if that product was to go wrong, it wouldn't bankrupt our company or anything like that. So, you know, by staying focused and knowing, eventually that's how you get there. Eventually there'll be enough money. Eventually there'll be enough customers. Eventually we'll have a chance. Doesn't mean it'll work, right? But that's that's kind of how we look at it. Just, just keep pushing forward, even if it's only a little bit at a time, just make sure we don't have to go backwards. Don't make mistakes, right? Every time you gotta, if you fall backwards, you stand back up, you still got to pick up all that weight and just, ugh. but if you fall back, it might be three steps back. So it's easier to take a tiny step forward than it is to fall down. And I know that's kind of a cheesy, uh, you know, thing to be talking about, but that's, uh, that's our mentality. Business stuff rolling in. Uh, let's see here. Lastly, you said, I would love it if you'd post more business or finance videos. I actually like the way you talk about business more than uh, Graham, Stefan, or other known channels. You're very real and blunt and have the passion when you explain things. Um, I like how you don't, wait, I like how when you don't agree with something, you don't hold back. Yeah, and that's that's just it. There's There's plenty of people that want to sell you the dream online and they're very successful at what they do and they might help you be successful. You know, Gary Vee is one of them. Like I've, I've met him, I've met some of these other people and you know, part of it is, are you trying to sell the dream of you'll be successful or are you actually showing them what you're doing? Um, I just like talking business, honestly, and it's, it's good to kind of talk through things and, and also I want to kind of document um, where I am at a certain point. Cause then you look back, you're like, that's crazy that that warehouse looked that way, that this is what we thought, you know, or that, oh man, that was, you were so naive to think that you wouldn't use Facebook and Google and now you're, you're spending millions. Now it's been 10 years later or something. Um, so it's good to document and reflect and, and you can also go like, yeah, I still do believe that. I still do believe in the environment. I still do believe the big guy or the small guy can beat the big guy. We can do better customer service. We can be more nimble. We can do these things. Is that panning out? Were we right? Um, what did we get wrong? Learn from that too. So got about 10 minutes left. We'll, we'll cap this at like the hour mark because I've got work I should be doing. I just felt like, I just felt like rapping. Macklemore song. How much does a high dollar customer spend at the co-op? I feel like I spend a lot. Uh, I would say the high end customers Hmm. It's a range, but I would say to be in the top 20%, something like that. I don't know. I, I don't know this, this specific percentage, but it, you would have spent over $5,000. There are people, you know, part of it is it's not the biggest percentage, but you got to remember like, oh, that person's a doctor with unlimited income and they just spent 10 grand this month because they're building a fish room. Like that kind of stuff happens rarely, right? You've also got people that have ordered or, or bought from us 400 times, right? Because they've been coming to our retail store since we opened and they buy from us every single week. So um, some people spend an ent uh, just an insane amount of money, but the majority of people would probably be more in like the spent less than $100, I would say. 
um, you know, they get some fertilizer and maybe they're new to the hobby. And, and the goal is to, you know, kind of, obviously if you, everyone spends a billion dollars, that's amazing, right? But the reality is you're trying to get more of that middle sector of like, okay, I want them just to keep buying from me. I want to keep providing a good product and have them stay with me long term. You know, it's, it, I don't think you can really focus on, well, how do I find the other people that are like celebrities and making fish rooms? That market is very narrow. So how do I just stay relevant with people that are in the hobby, plan to stay in the hobby, might have fish rooms or not, or maybe they have a family and for the next 12 years, they're going to take care of their aquarium. How do we service them best? And we focus on that. And so over time, and that's that thing, you're always taking a step forward. If we continually work on that, in three years, we'll know, hey, we did bring this person on with our company for the last three years. We were successful. You can't make a change today and know like, oh, does that mean they stay with us for five years? You can't know that till it's been five years. So um, yeah, some people spend an absolute ton of money. Some people spend almost no money at all, right? But they're all important, you know, like, a doctor that spends $10,000 in one month and builds an entire fish room, are they more important than the eight-year-old who spends his allowance of $4 a week buying one guppy, but they might stay with us for the next 30 years, right? So everyone's important and figuring out how do we serve that eight-year-old just like we're serving this person over here, just like we're serving this customer over here and try to, to, do, to do a good job with everyone. Not knowing that we can't serve everyone, like that's, you can never do it all, but how do we target what we want and do that the best? Would we ever consider moving our retail store to a larger building? Um, we, we, I don't think we're gonna try and move it. We're not trying to move it. We would like to expand it if we could. Um, it's, it's hard. The retail store it is profitable but not nearly as much percentage-wise, margin-wise, as selling online. So it takes 50% of our, like so, of the time we appropriate to it, it takes half as much time as the online side, except, uh, except it makes us less money, right? And so part of that is, just in general, a local customer wants to know what fish you got in stock, more customer service, more of all those things. Uh, whereas online, they can kind of see that, they can order it, live fish can die, we don't have that online. And so there's a lot that goes into it. So making it bigger is better for the community and we value that. Uh, profitability wise, usually the bigger you go, the less profitable you become in a retail store. You have more employees when it's slow, you're losing even more in wages. You have more theft. You have to stock more. You have more cleaning. You have more heat. You have more electricity. And so all these things grow exponentially where typically it won't match just uh, the sales as well. So we, we, but we are definitely looking at it, considering it in a perfect world, we could expand it a bit more. Um, and we, there's definitely some plans there that we're hoping to enact at some point. But again, it's that when is the time right we, we're never in a race. That's the thing is like, you know, oh, you desperately need, you desperately need to expand. It's like, well, sure, but we could do that next year or the year after or 10 years from now. Like, that's the good thing is when, at least when you have a company and you are profitable, you're, you're worried about how do I make more money instead of how do I make enough money? And so we're, we're lucky to be in that employees are paid, bills are paid, all of that is working. And so, you know, if, it's like going, ah, I should probably buy a house one of these days. You don't need to buy it tomorrow, but you should be going, yeah, I'm saving towards it. I'm working towards it. And the longer you take, the more money you'll have. So if we don't expand for another three years, we'll have more money and our store will be even better when we do expand. What advice would you give for online fish stores to increase traffic? Uh, stop being bad. <laughs> I, there's so many examples of this. I, I got one today. Um, I ordered, I found a fish that I've been looking for for a very long time, right? And, and by a long time, I mean, I think 11 years. So I, I finally found it last night. And I email them and they, they sell this fish online. And I say, hey, if this fish is still available, I'd like to buy it. And 
after I, I sent that, I was looking a little more and, oh, they got a video of this fish. So I click on the video and it says, this fish is $155, right? They had listed the fish for 175 and the video was posted yesterday. So then I get the invoice from the company and they charged me 175 and I'm just like, ah, it's, I've been looking for this fish a long time. It's worth it. Okay. That's fine. You know, but I, I was thinking, I was like, it's not very smart to put up a video saying the fish is $155 and then charge the customer 175 because if they had seen this like me and they weren't a business person, they'd be now fighting you for that $20 off, whatever. So I get the invoice today. And then also there's a convenience fee. Right? And I was like, convenience fee? Huh. All right. Well, it's 2.9% plus 30 cents, the PayPal fee. And now I'm going, ah, oh, geez, you're bad at business. You're so bad at business. No one charges the fees. Bad gas stations do, right? Or they do it on a very cheap purchase, but not on a 200 plus dollar purchase. Are you going, no, you have to pay the percentage, right? And they didn't give me an option to pay in check. Not that I would have, but like, just build that into the price. So it's already like, we're at 175. We already know you're willing to sell for 155. Oh, now you're charging 3%, basically. Okay. And then on top of that, there was a $12 box and uh, insulation fee, right? We talked about heat packs earlier. Like, oh, okay. So my $175 fish, let me see if I can pull this up. Let me see. Because then I can be right on instead of uh, trying to make sure that I recount it correctly. Right here. Um, I just got to find my PayPal invoice. That's all I got to find. There it is. I'm going to view it. All right. So, yes. Box, box and packing. Applies to all live fish shipments, $12, all right? Convenience fee was 2.9% plus 30 cents, right? Then the shipping itself, so that doesn't, not include it with the box fee, was $44. So my original shipment was 175 right? Which could have been 155 Now is $238. So my advice is... <clears throat> Just tell me the price I need to pay. I would have paid it either way, but now I'm thinking like, oh yeah, you had to charge me a box fee. Oh yeah, you had to charge me for the PayPal fee. Oh yeah, you're charging me for shipping. And they've already got <clears throat> other crazy bad practices. Shipments are processed Monday through Wednesday each week, depending on the shipping distance from California. Tracking information is sent. Please check ahead of time before you order to see how many days it'll take to get to you. It's just like... This is like outside of them having a very rare fish I've been looking for. There is no upside. They're getting my money because of the rarity of an item, not because they have good customer service. So the first thing is fixing things like that. So on an online store, don't charge those extra fees. Bake it into the price, right? The shipping should have been, make it $50, $55. Don't charge the convenience fee. Don't charge the box fee. A $12 box fee, all that shows me is you guys are very inefficient at buying boxes and styrofoam. I've shipped thousands and thousands of fish online before. It's not $12. I also know they have not negotiated with PayPal. They're paying a high rate with PayPal. So they're not saving anyone any money there either. So then it starts thinking like, oh, maybe I'm overpaying for shipping. I know I'm $20 overpaying for that fish compared, I already knew they'd sell for 20 bucks less. So it's leaving this bad taste in my mouth. Now, this is all before they've even shipped. This is all giving ammo. So what it does, is it sets up a customer. When this lands, if it, this fish arrives not alive or really sick, it's gonna compound the problems. Just like we talked about earlier in the stream where we ship something, now the plant's half frozen. People are gonna be angry. I'm going to be, I'm much more likely to be disappointed when it's like, I paid all this extra money for this good box charge. I paid the fees. I paid the overnight shipping fee. I paid $20 more than your asking price on the fish. And then if they give me any guff, if something was going wrong forever, they'll be tainted in my mind. Right? 
So that's the kind of stuff that you need to do. Now, when it comes to a local fish store, because you had the same question, focus on good experience. Do you have enough parking? Do you have a clean bathroom? Do you make people wait out in the cold? We're guilty of that. That's why we got the restaurant system. It's cold out right now. You have to wait. Go wait in your warm car. This thing will buzz. We'll get you in. We'll, you know, everyone's limited to 20 minutes. So if you're fifth in line, know that we got four people on average. You'll have to wait a max of 30 minutes till you're back out of here, right? <clears throat> try to do as much as you can and continually try to improve. Right now, one of our biggest things is we don't have a phone because it rings off the hook. We're looking into how can we serve local customers and field uh, phone questions that are basically unending, right? So continually try to improve where I find <clears throat> there's a lot of attitude in business. Well, if they don't want to do business the way I want to do business, then they can go somewhere else. <clears throat> and that's always a true statement. And they probably will. That's the thing is they will. So when businesses are struggling and things like that, usually you got to look inward. And I've definitely had to do a lot of that when I was working in the store and YouTube took, had taken off and online had taken off. We had gotten uh, a bad feedback of how I was grumpy with someone. And it, it was a wake up call for me. Like, I'm not the grumpy guy. I don't try to be, but I was like, I get it. I'm overworked and I got to get out of the store. I can't do all of the stuff I got to do besides be in the store, like that eight hour day in the store. And it was where I was staying up till now, two or three o'clock in the morning, right? To get it done. So now I am that 16, 18, 19 hours working, not sleeping enough. Then my work performance was going down. And so I, I had to do that. So I think the advice is how do you increase traffic? Stop sending traffic away. Most often, people are stuck in, traffic's coming in, but they're bouncing back out. They're not repeat customers. They're not liking what they see. You know, the fact that I couldn't buy that fish. Like, another thing is, I couldn't click, like, buy it now, pay it all, and be done with it. I had to email the person, ask them if they still had it. Then they had to confirm it. Then they had to send me an email address. And the reality is, if I had seen that fish on any other website, I would have already bought it there. They would have sent me this email today and be like, ah, sorry, I've already purchased one. I've had that happen before too. And so, you know, find usually, I usually say this in, in YouTube, but it applies for all business. Whoever screws up the least is the one that wins. As humans, we're so error prone, you know, we're easy to get lazy, easy to make mistakes, all of that. And so... Whoever does that the least is usually who pulls ahead. And when you get a bigger team behind you, you make less mistakes because you have more people checking work. So I would say focus on eliminating reasons to not shop with someone. That's the first thing that I always do of like, you've, you've given them a reason not to. You know, that $6.72 convenience fee doesn't make me feel good. $12 box fee doesn't make me feel good. $44 shipping doesn't make me feel great. You know, in a, in a day and age when, you know, think about this, you spent over $200 and there's not free shipping around? What? Even though I was willing to pay it, I paid it all. I did order this, right? Because it was something I wanted. But think about that. When you're comparing your customer or your competitors, like there are sites that ship fish for free at a certain threshold, especially usually over 200, right? There's all these things. So how many things do you have in place that are, People are coming up and they're going, ooh, kitchen looks dirty. I'm not eating there. Ooh, bathroom is dirty. I'm not eating here. Ooh, that person didn't wash their hands. Not eating here. Like we see it all the time in restaurants. We give reasons not to come back. Food wasn't good. You know, food was burnt this time. Delivery took too long. Saw something I didn't like. Ooh, right? And you just replace it with, oh, we go here instead. That's what happens. Traffic comes in, but it doesn't stay. All right. Do we plan on having a plant sale in the future? Never. As it stands right now, we can't get enough plants and the cost of doing business has gone up a ton because of COVID. So I, I say never, it's just highly unlikely that usually when things go up in the world, they don't come back down. So fuel prices, flight prices, cost of plants, all of that. And uh, we also, it doesn't make sense to discount the cost of a good and keep up customer service. We just lose money. And that's, that's what we found when we looked at, we've now done years where we did discounts. 
and we've done years where we haven't done discounts. And we went from losing money and not really doing much to, oh, good, we're not going out of business. And we can hire more people to make a better situation happen. So we're, we're choosing that. And for sure, we will lose customers to lower priced uh, places. But on average, we see a lot of them come back going, oh, yeah, I didn't have, it was cheaper. But, you know, what you get, you know, and, and it's just, you can buy a cheeseburger for $2 at a fast food place. Or you can go get a nice burger made, right? Or you can make one at home. And we're going for that. You know, if you're looking for something better, great. If you need that cheap thing on the go, hey, eat somewhere else and we need something good, come back to us. Yeah. All right. I'm going to answer like maybe one or two more and I'm calling it. Do I foresee any business strategies that were created due to COVID uh, continuing in the future because of new consumer expectations? Yes. Uh, I think curbside pickup is not going anywhere. I think people love it. I myself love it. Uh, we have not implemented it yet because I find it to be one of the most difficult things to implement with live fish. You know, you can kind of imagine, oh, I'd like to buy a dog. And then you pull up to the person's house and like, no, you can't come in. Just pick one on the website. We'll bring it out. You're just like, but this is a personal pet. Like, I really want to choose and make sure it's healthy. And that's the problem. We, If it was only dry goods, we would have adopted this model already. Like, yep, we'll have your order waiting for you. No problem at all. With the live fish, people want to choose boys and girls and how many and how good do they look and all of that. But I think in general, uh, like fast food places and, and Best Buy and all of that, it's really nice to be out, buy online. You know, if I need to buy a phone, right? Because usually the way a consumer works now, they're going to research online and they go, hey, I want this phone. And then they go, oh, I should order it. Oh, I wonder if Best Buy has it. Oh, it's the same price? Uh, I'm kind of too, I don't have time to go in. I'm kind of too lazy. Oh, Apple have it here tomorrow? <sighs> I'll just order from Apple. But now that you can do curbside pickup, like, oh, I could, just go, I could have it in 10 minutes from now. All right, I'll go do that. I'll drive there. I'll grab lunch. I'll grab it, right? So you typically do that more often. I think people are falling in love with that. Now, you have the opposite experience of like Home Depot. I'll do a curbside pickup. I've been waiting 40 minutes. This is insane. I'm never doing this again. So as long as they're quick, I think that'll be adopted long term. Uh, also, I've seen local restaurants, right? They will tell me they're far more profitable doing a drive through window than they are having seating. Someone sits down, four people sit down, they order four plates of food, they talk, they might get a soda, right? So they each buy a soda. So now you've got four sodas, four plates of food. Let's say on average, that was $15 a plate, $60. And they sat there for an hour or an hour and a half. Now, you have to have a waiter, waiter or waitress come in and check on them, do refills. What else can I get you? So you're paying for that staff back and forth all the time. And they might get a tip, right? Or you take that same waiter or waitress, and now they're serving a drive through window. They might touch 50 times the revenue. And so now... That square footage is kind of wasted in the front. They take less staff. They get more orders through. They do less dishes, right? All of these things are now more efficient. So I think we're going to see a lot of those, um, a lot of those trends continue based on business needing it of like, wow, this is actually a more profitable way. And consumers also wanting it of like, this is a more efficient way. In general, if we can make it... Uh, easier for a customer, they will like that. And they'll come to demand it, really. Do I ever lament becoming so successful online that you can't really spend time in your store? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not so much that I can't spend time in my store. It's that I can't spend time not working. Uh, like I had to put my foot down. It was last Monday. And... Basically, we had run out of a product. It was in a cargo container at the new house that I don't even get to live in yet. And it basically came down to, am I going to go to the gym and work out? Because I've hired a personal trainer. Because obviously, you know, my, my weight and all that is, is an issue, right? And I was angry that I, have, I had to make a decision. Am I going to go work out and keep my body healthy or am I going to fulfill this business duty? And I made someone else do it. I go, this is insane. Cause I work out for 90 minutes twice a week. And I was like, this is insane that it is difficult week after week for me to get in 
three hours of personal time. And so I've made a decision. I'm scaling back. I'm, tr I'm doing anything I can of like, it's not healthy to only have three hours a week to spend outside of sleeping and working. There's three hours, right? And so that's why I started uh, camping every other week for a day. That's part of this. Uh, and it's part of the reason I'll slow down a little bit too, is going, you know, it's not worth trading my health and all of that to just, uh, you know, earn more money, be better, whatever, right? At a certain point, it's not good for you. And I've long passed that point. And so now it's time to strategically hire people. Uh, if this latest hire signs on tomorrow, we'll have hired five people in the last two weeks. <laughs> And it's purely to offload things. Like the higher you go up in the company, the more you're just, you know, that the more you've got on your back and you're just, oh, must keep going, right? And so if you can go, hey, there's a friend next to me. All right, hand them some. Now we're moving at a faster pace, right? So uh, yeah. And do I miss being at the store? Being at the store is really fun. Talking to people, seeing people have success. All of those are great things. And I do miss it, yes. What I, I miss in that aspect, I miss the store when I wasn't on YouTube. So it was just a customer and a fish nerd and making a great aquarium. Instead of now, unfortunately, when I'm at the store, it's me, fans and customers, and a line for selfies and signatures and, and that. And I'm very blessed and fortunate to have that because that leads to, you know, money and, and business and all of that but it has forever eliminated. It's rare when I'm, I can just talk to someone that's in the aquarium world that just knows me as like, that's a fish nerd and not, oh, that's Corey from Aquarium Co-op. And so when I get that interaction, it's very cherished for me of like, great, they don't know who I am and I'm just another fish nerd and they're just another fish nerd. That's great. Um, so yes, I definitely miss those days, but you know, I don't think anyone would trade it. You know, no one's going to be like, oh, would you rather be less successful? No one would rather be less successful, but you do miss it. You do miss when things were easier and kind of more simple. And uh, yeah. All right. So that's all I've got for today. I'll try and do this at some other point. There is no schedule. Um, it's whenever I feel like it. This is kind of a channel that gets resurrected every once in a while for a little bit and then goes because I get too busy. Hopefully, if I've done my job right. I'll have plenty of time because I'll have offloaded enough things and I could do this more often, but I make no promises and uh, hopefully I'll send this link to that person that sent the email and uh, look at the video form of it. So thanks for hanging out, guys. Sorry I didn't answer uh, you know, more of your questions, if you will. And uh, yeah, good luck in business, I would say. It's, it's, a, you know, it's a tough animal. You got you to gotta fight against it all the time. You get gray hair like me. So all right, we'll see you guys later.